All right, so today I got Den Bartholomew Hume the first, farrier, horseshoer, team roper extraordinaire. So one of the things I think is super cool about Denton, and one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with him is, one, he is a full-time horseshoer, but two, he's competed in the World Series of Team Roping at a pretty high level. Um, so pretty pretty cool. Last year, you and your brother Chase won over $180,000 check for World Series. I think you took second. Place, we did, yep, right? we did. Dang it. Second place, the first loser. That's what Ricky Bobby says. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the check for first? Oh, uh, it the, they it would have been like one hundred twenty four thousand a man. The first place check got so per team or per person per man. So it had been like two forty eight to the team, but you guys are um, going down again. We're going down again. Yeah, it's gonna be. We're excited because this year, like last year, we were only qualified in one division. This year, we're qualified in two divisions. So we got two bullets instead of one. It's a lot easier to kill a bear with two bullets instead of one. (laughs) Most farriers spend their time underneath a horse where you've spent your time training, roping. Like you, you know both sides of it. You know how they ride based on certain shoeing, which I think is actually pretty unique in the space. Uh, How'd you get into horseshoeing? Uh, you down that path? You know, I remember watching my father-in-law a number of years back when I was first married, my father-in-law shod for years, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'd seen my dad and, and, and my brother Scott do it growing up. And uh, I always thought it was cool, but I never dug into it a ton. I was watching my father-in-law down in, in uh, uh, Utah County do it one day. And the thought just hit, hit, hit my head, you know what, why am I paying somebody to do something I'm fully capable of doing myself? Yeah. And it finally intrigued me enough at that point, I said, all right, Today's the day that I, I'm done watching somebody do it. I need to do this now. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe for the start, just to save myself some money, but it's also another way for me to learn to maintain my own horses and better understand them and, and help them. And, uh, you know, anybody that's ever shot horses knows that if people find out you can shoe a horse, you know, you'll never starve. You'll always be able to put a, a little bit of food on the table because you have that skill, you know. Yeah. If And uh, it doesn't matter what you do for your day job or whatever, even if you don't shoot full time. Uh, there's always people that are like, hey, if this guy can shoe a horse, you know, somebody's going to want to, you know, bug you to get shoes on their horse. But anyway, so that kind of started the ball rolling. Um, I, I started playing with it. Uh, I followed a few guys around, shadowing them, things like that, and then, I uh, got to the point where everybody's like, hey, hit the ground, roll with it, yeah. you know, go do it. And and so I did. And at first it was just a weekend warrior thing, you know, like, hey, I'm going to go make some extra cash. I had my day job um, and it was great for that. But my day job was not something I was passionate about. I, I, I mean, I was just there punching the clock. It wasn't something that I found passion in. And uh, I did in the shooting because I love horses and I, I've been around them all my life, and I, I knew it's something that I wanted to do. Life's too short to not do something that you love. Yeah. So uh, I vividly remember going to my boss at the time, and I said, hey, you know that I shoe on the weekends and stuff? He said, yeah. I said, it's time for me to take it full time. I was getting enough of a client base, uh, and I was comfortable doing it. I knew that the transition period had to be at a time when I was making as much shoeing as I was at my day job, you know, so that it could it could replace it. Yeah. So uh, I went to that, and he thought it was great. He actually, my boss at the time, he did his, shot his own horses and did a little bit on the side as well. And he's like, hey, man, it's great, you know, if you can do it and your body can hold up to it, uh, which being, being a man of not real big stature like myself, <laughs> it helps a lot, you know. Yeah. I have a one of my best friends uh, lives over in Downey, and he's six three, and he's always joking with me. He's like, cause, you know, because he'll shoe his his own and stuff, you know. And he's like, I, I hate the fact that you're so short that you can just, you know, crawl under him like you do. And he said, if the horse isn't decent sized, like I'm splitting myself in half to get in under this thing. Yeah. And most horses, most average sized quarter horses, I can stand straight legged underneath them while I'm bent over working on their feet, you know? Yeah. So being a, being a shorter guy, 
just like a jockey, little guy, you know, it works out. It works out great. I don't have to bust myself nearly as hard. Tall, tall horseshoers have a lot tougher time, but I've found a lot of passion in it. And I found a couple of guys that I can shadow under, um, and some vets that I work under, um, that I, I'm always texting them, calling them, asking them questions, and a few other really good farriers. And I, I just crave the knowledge. I'm, I'm bugging them about knowledge all the time. Yeah. Try to tell myself I can never learn enough yeah. because the day that you quit trying to learn is the day that you're, you're done. You're, yeah. you know, your, your skill set is tapped out. Yeah. And uh, this is one of those, you've done enough of it to know that it's a black hole of yeah. learning and, and information and I was also the tall guy that the guy that I shadowed said, you're too tall to shoot yeah. full time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I found a cool niche in it and I've had a lot of fun with it. And I'm very particular about the type of client that I want and will cater to. And so I cover quite a wide swath with my client base, but it's because I, I go to the people and cater to those that are the type of client that I want with the type of horses that I want. Yeah, so um, let's let's talk about that type of client. Like, what's some of the criteria? Like, how are they prepped and ready to go when you show up? Like, what kind of surface are you wanting to shoe on? What kind of behavior is their horse, or what kind of state of mind is their horse in when you show up that makes you say, "Hey, these are my good clients." Sure. Yeah, I've I've got uh, quite a few of those, and they've they've become very good friends as well. Uh, when I show up, they're if they have horses that are they know they're prone to be jittery or young. They're younger. They don't have as much patience and uh, their attention span is shorter. You know, all young horses like that. Or just a horse that's naturally fidgety because I do horses that aren't just quarter horses either. Yeah. You know, I do half drafts. I have a few Arabians on my books. I've done, the, uh, I've done a handful of Frisians. I've done warm bloods. I've done, uh, I mean, quite a few different breeds. Um, and some of those clients, you know, we, we've kind of decided in, in me doing them a little bit through trial and error, you know, Hey, why don't you take this horse out and run them around the round crawl a little bit for 30 minutes before I show up, you know, let, yeah. let's get the sting out of them. Let's get the jitters out of them. Um, get their, mind in the right spot. get their mind in the right spot, you know, just, just like, uh, or they'll say, Hey, I'm planning on riding today. Uh, and you're going to shoe. I have some people that board, uh, up in Blackfoot, Idaho, you know, and I've told them, you know, hey, if you're going to ride today, do it, do it right before I come. That way, that horse's mind is in a, in, a, in a better place and it's more prepared for me to show up and work on its feet. Yeah. Uh, and there's not as much, you know, sting and, and silliness behind the horse. And it's, it's safer for me and the horse. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing, too, because, like, all of us horse owners should be really conscientious of our horses or our, our farrier safety. Um, it's cause it's a long run game and you earn every stinking dollar when it's a hundred degrees outside, just for anybody that's watching, this is Northern Utah, Southwestern Wyoming, Southeastern Idaho, kind of that, that's the whole swath that, that Den covers all the way up to Blackfoot and Star Valley on down to, to here. Uh, in, in northern Utah. Um, so, but going back to that, I think a lot of us who train have been in the circumstance where we got a colt that we probably need to pound some miles on, um, but we also don't want to put them lame. We know they're not going to stand good for the farrier. What are some of our options? A lot of farriers, like, this is how they provide for their family. They're putting themselves in sure. kind of a risky position being underneath a horse. There's a lot of us who train, though, that have been in the position where we got to get miles on a colt, colt or a horse that's you know kind of a little stingy we also don't want to put them lame we need to get some shoes on them what are some of the options in that scenario to both keep you safe and make sure like that horse is going to stand there sure so one of the things that i think is the best idea to do call up your vet whoever you trust the most uh, and, and schedule an appointment, get me, you, and your vet all on the same page. We can, meet, we can all meet up together. Yeah. That vet can safely sedate that horse. He's the one, you know, that has the right stuff needed. Yeah. Uh, and and if, it, if the horse maybe needs to be put in a stock to get a needle in its neck. I've had young horses that, 
you know, they're just like people. Some do all right with needles and some do terrible with needles. Yeah. So, you know, if needs be, he needed to put one in a stock or something like that. Get them sedated a little bit to take the edge off. And yeah. then I can safely get under that horse. I can put shoes on them, even though mentally they may not be ready for that all the way. Yeah. You know, if they're young, but you know, you, you, you're wanting to take them out and get miles and do some things, but they aren't quite ready for the, the full shooting experience. We can sedate them a little bit. I can get underneath them. I can get their feet done and uh, then you can take them out and go do what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the, the best route to take and it's, it's safe for everybody. Uh, you know, I provide for my family with my body and I, I have to take care of it the best I can. You yeah. know, I, I can't show up and, and just have somebody say, yeah, well, good luck, see what happens. You yeah. know, I mean, that's, that's, that's terrible, terrible practice. I mean, I, it, it's, I don't know who would, in their right mind would want to think that that's great. You know, yeah, an so 1,100 pound animal. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chatter in here too, because I think one thing that gets overlooked, and back when I was shooing in college, people expect you to be the one to train their horse to stand as the horseshoer, and it's not your job. Like when you're, when I was doing it, we were trying to get three to four horses done a night after our day jobs, and when you show up and you got to work a horse for 30 minutes, it's like that much further keeping you from other horses you got to do and from your family. So I think to drive that point home, like if you're new to horsemanship at all, you need to understand it is your job to prep your horse for the horseshoer to keep the horseshoer safe, your horse safe and everybody safe. So that's, that's something I really want to drive home um, before we kind of move on. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and it'll make it so that he'll want to show up and answer your phone call next time you want your horse done. Um, I have a lot of clients, you know, that in the past that, that I've showed up and their horse either wasn't ready mentally to stand and uh, have his feet trimmed or shod and or, or it was a bad setup, you know, the horse was standing in the mud, you know, yeah. I didn't have a, a clean dry place to do that horse at. In these uh, seasonal places like where we live sometimes this time of year it's tough to to find that not yeah. everybody has a barn or cover or something to get out of you know i've even yeah. I, we literally with, with people that have enough room uh i've said hey you know what's your garage like on your house i've literally taken horses right in right inside their garage yeah you know we just leave the door open go in there it's flat ground it's dry it's clean yeah. You know, and we take them right in the garage uh, if, if the horse is willing to do so. Yeah. But having having the right setup where the horse isn't standing in the mud and the gunk, yeah. uh, in a in a place where other animals aren't going to come bug it. If you have more than one horse, you know, don't have them st st uh, standing right next to each other where they might bug each other. Yeah. While I'm underneath them trying to work on them. Yeah. Spread spread them apart enough to where they're not going to, you know, there's no going to not going to be any horse play between them and and. Uh, messing around but um, those are the kind of things and and don't you know if you're if your farrier shows up and does the job that you appreciate and he finishes up don't tell him hey you know I'll, I'll venmo you in a week or whatever you don't go to the milk and yeah. you don't go to the store and get milk and then tell the grocery store you're going to pay for it later yeah um, well there's a lot of overhead with horseshoeing there's like a ton. between shoes and yeah. fuel because you're i mean you're driving you got like a 200 mile radius you're you're sure. driving and, and I have a lot of people that they'll joke with me, you know, it sounds like, you know, if you're doing X amount of horses per week, you know, at a hundred bucks a head, you know, you're making pretty decent money. I said, well, have you seen the price at the uh, fuel pumps lately? You know, do you yeah. know how much steel has gone up recently? Yeah. So between my shoes, nails, rasps that I go through quite frequently and yeah. mileage on my vehicle, wear and tear, tires, fuel, all that, you know, it, there's, there's not as much profit in it as you would think and anybody that shoes will be able to tell you that but yeah. um the other uh, thing so this is super this is like a super funny point with horse people because you know you'll get you'll get people that you know they move away from home they had horses growing up and they remember their dad buying a horse for 800 bucks or 1200 bucks we covered this on another video actually um and here we are like 22 years later inflation's been crazy and they still want to pay that for a horse. They're still like, that's their budget is like 800 bucks. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, you can, you can find something for 800 bucks. Paper but or it's, plastic. It's the same with horseshoers. Yeah. I find like 
I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I should still pay 65 bucks to shoe a horse. And that's not the market we're anymore. There's not enough, there's not, it's just basic supply and demand, right? The demand for horseshoers is much higher than the supply and the supply of good horseshoers is pretty low. Sure. So that means like, if you have a good horseshoer, I mean, you really shouldn't bat an eye at 120, 150, even 200 bucks, depending on where you are. Right you know, per, per head. Sure. That's just kind of how it is. Sure. And I've, I've had a few tell, people tell me that I'm, I'm still too cheap, but with rising fuel costs and everything, I, I may have to do an increase again next year after the first of the year. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's the days of the $65 horseshoe and are gone unless it's, and if you find a $65 horseshoe, you should probably run, yeah. right? <laughs> you should probably raise an eyebrow because <laughs> Either he hasn't done it since back when it was 65 a horse, yeah. you know, so he's not, you know, he's a little rusty on it. But anyways, uh, yeah, there's, and, and that's why I, I have a few vets and, and other very, very seasoned farriers that I work with continually. I, I'm texting them pictures constantly. I'm calling them, bugging them, asking them questions, asking them how I can, you know, uh, help horses better and differently in, in special cases with, you know, founder and laminitis and things like that. Yeah. And uh, just trying to constantly sponge it all in because I don't, I know guys that have shod for 20 years, but they've never gotten any better because after three years, they said, I know everything I need to know. So they've literally shod the same way for 15 years, Yeah. you know, and, and they've never gotten any better. They've just always done it the same, but I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy who in 20 years from now, I shoot 20 times better Yeah. than I do now. You know, I, I, I constantly, want to be learning and with the technology that we have now to look at horses feet through x-rays and, and different things you know and, and study we're able to look at horses feet in a lot different way and and be able to understand it a lot better yeah and uh, it's it's been really neat to see I've had I was down in Heber City Utah uh, doing some horses for a, an outfitter down there and there was a vet there doing pre-purchase exams on a bunch of horses and uh, he had a, a a mobile x-ray unit and I literally I had just finished shoeing a horse and he went over and was doing a pre-purchase exam on it and taking x-rays on it within 20 minutes of when I had finished it and I went over and I said hey doc let me see that I just barely finished that horse and he was he was more than cool about it and uh, it was cool to see that reference of my work right when I finished it I said hey you know give me your two cents what are your thoughts look, let's look at this you know and uh, we, we looked at it and talked it over and, and it was awesome because it was another way for me to learn and yeah. become even better. Yeah, that's cool. You know, so. How many, uh, at, at your peak season, how many horses are you shooing in a day? In a day, I, I do six to eight. Uh, an old family friend of ours that has been like a father to me in a lot of ways, he, he shot horses for 40 years and he said, promise me you won't be the guy that tries to do 10 a day you know, the money's good, but your, your body will not last and you'll hate yourself for it Yeah. because you didn't spend enough time at home with the kids or things like that. So he said, put a limit on it because you can still do six to eight a day, make a decent living, you yeah. know? And, uh, so in peak season, I'm doing six to eight a day. Yeah. And, uh, that's a lot of horses try. to squat under. It do is. You, do you know how much you can squat a barbell? No. I'll bet I, it's a lot. I, it probably is. And my, <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I don't have time to go to the gym enough to really find out. You're just in the gym every day. I'm in the gym every day. Under under two of Joe Biden's mama. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I do. I go to the chiropractor at least once a month. Yeah. He, he and I are very good pals. <laughs> we know each other well. We have it down to a science. I walk in. He knows exactly. You know, I I'll do the electrodes and they'll warm up my muscles and get them loose. Yeah. And then he he knows exactly where to pop me and how to pop me. You know, and we don't even talk about what he's going to do because it's the same song and dance every time. <laughs> you know, we're check, we're yeah. talking about, you know, the the Super Bowl or the Dodgers game or whatever because fruity beverages, fruity beverages, because he knows it's the same deal every time. But anyways, uh, yeah, it's it's super physical. One of my best friends that I grew up with, he's a he's quite a gym rat and uh, is is really seen some good results and he's always trying to he goes in the evenings you know he gets yeah. his kids down for bed 
um, then, then he's not leaving his wife with a bunch of rambunctious kids. He helps her get, get him to bed, and then he goes into the gym at like 9.30 every night. Yeah. And he'll text me a lot, hey, let's go to the gym, let's go to the gym. Usually by that time, I am so, especially in my peak season, I am so worn out by the end of the day. I'm like Six to eight hours is a lot. I'm like, buddy, I've been to the gym all day today. You know, like I might have not been doing necessarily cardio, but, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, I, it'll wear you right out. But there's give and take because we live in a seasonal, seasonal area where, uh, you know, this time of year I'm coming into a slowdown period. A lot of people are just pulling shoes and trimming horses for the winter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I have kind of a nest egg that I'll build up during my peak season and set aside. So this time of year, my wife's getting a lot more of me at home and my kids. And it's fun in that aspect. She probably wants and to, your snowmobile and my snowmobile. And my wife probably <laughs> wants to punch me by January, you know, yeah. but, uh, yeah, we, we find a little bit to, to play and enjoy in winter. And I cut down, I'll bet you my, my, the amount of horses I do cuts to about a third. Um, I do have one barn that I still shoe at in the winter uh, that they, they rope and stuff all through the winter. Yeah. And so they're, they stay pretty regular through the winter. But just because of the nature of the area, I, I do mostly just um, this time of year, I'm just pulling stuff. and Like I'll, March through October. Yeah, and, and uh, I'll... I'll uh, I'll pull them and then that we'll leave them trim for it because they'll grow a little bit slower in the winter too when it's colder, you know, yeah. so I, I won't touch them again for nine or 10 weeks on a trim, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, this kind of reminds me, you know, pulling them, I think it's good for them to go barefoot for a little bit in the winter too, for their feet to kind of mm -hmm. regenerate a little bit. Um, let's talk real quick about some of the myths that kind of make you laugh as a horseshoer, right? So there's kind of like this natural horsemanship stuff with barefoot trimming, mm -hmm. where they think you can stick your horse in some soft pasture mm -hmm. and then ride it up into the hills on the rocks and not have any issues. Right. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I, I think it's hilarious. Through, through uh, domestic breeding and things that we've done, we've in a lot of ways, we bred the feet right off these horses, right? Yeah. They don't have the same feet as, as the Mustangs that uh, are out cruising the hills. Um, I do, I, I have some Mustangs on my books uh, that have come, been rounded up and brought in and then adopted. And there's no comparison between domesticated, you know, bred horses and those Mustangs feet. Um, there are some of them that they're they, a lot harder, way harder in every aspect. Really? Yep. And, and it's interesting to note the shape of the Mustang's feet, uh, the way the good Lord has been shaping them out there on that kind of terrain. Uh, most of them, they'll look like, they'll look like the shape of a, of a horseshoe that you play horseshoes with in your yard. Yeah. Squared the, up a little bit. The toes, the toes are squared toes off. And, yep. Toes are squared and rounded off and their heels are really, really wide. Um, and, and that's the way the good Lord is wearing these horses' feet out there in nature. And uh, a lot of a lot of shoeing through the years has and, and shoers have kind of adopted the idea that hey, if that's the good the way the good Lord is shaping their feet out there, there's probably something to it, you know. Yeah. And, and we should probably just with that break over. Yeah, yep. And break yeah. break over is huge, you know. So we try to get these horses' toes out of their way without completely, you know, taking their foot away from. I, I like to give a horse as much foot as I can underneath them yeah. without it being in their way, yeah. you know? So there's definitely a balance there and a happy medium. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's no comparison. Um, these domesticated horses that have, that have been bred and, and raised domestically, not hardly any of them have the kind of foot that, that a Mustang does in any sort of way. So it's interesting. You, you so even if you were to leave a Mustang on like a pretty soft pasture and then go into the hills, you think it'd, it'd hold up? I think good. it'd still do all right, yeah. yeah. Just through its, its genetics, a uh, uh, little bit of draft influence in there and some other things. Um, you'll notice if you ever looked at a, at a draft horse's foot or a half draft, um, the, those draft genetics, they have super wide and thick frogs, which is, which is great. Uh, and a lot of Mustangs, one of, one of my best friends up there in Bear Lake, he, uh, he's got a Mustang. He, he was born in captivity, but his mother was captured while she was pregnant with him. Okay. And uh, his feet are that way. He's probably 15'1". So he's not a huge horse, just a solid average size uh, quarter horse yeah. and wears a size two shoe all the way around. Wow. He's got a solid foot. Um, and we, we went out and, and helped round up and ship some cows with some neighbors 
uh, a week and a half ago, and he, he called me and he goes, hey, I know we pulled and trimmed already, but I want to ride him. Do I need to throw some shoes back on him? I said, absolutely not. You know, because in that horse's case, he was fine. Yeah. Most other horses, you know, 90% of, of the other horses, the whole barefoot idea, I, I'm not big on, you yeah. know, they, they don't have the foot for it. Um, I don't, I, I'm not an Indian. I, I haven't been running out in the, in the, in the woods <laughs> barefoot or on moccasins. I haven't built that callus yes, on my Mohican foot. Mohican style. Yeah, I haven't done that. And so my feet, if I wanted to go cruise across the gravel driveway, my feet are not prepared and ready for that. Yeah. Um, and so I need shoes on to go do that, right? Yeah. So I feel like that's when to approach shoe and there's a lot of that kind of common sense type of thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and also like even you take a Mustang and then throw 200 pounds on your back, that's a lot different pressure Yes. when you're riding through rocks than if they're, they don't have anything on them at all. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. So, yep, they've got to got to have that protection on their feet, you know, because you can stone bruise one stone bruise one out there. Fester, in, fester into an abscess, and depending on where the abscess is, you know, blows out at the coronary band or back at the heel or whatever. I've seen those turn into a year-long healing process, you know, because at the coronary band, at the hairline, it takes, on average, a full year for that hoof to grow out to the very bottom. Mm. And so for that to grow all the way down from where it blew out at the top or whatever, you know, yeah. ideally we like them to blow out at the bottom, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, it takes a full year, so. So this, this actually is a great point too, because I remember when I was shoeing, occasionally you would get um, people that would think, like they'd go, they'd go a year without shoeing or trimming their horse, mm -hmm. and they'd want it to be fully set right again after one shoeing. Right. And that, it, like if you're negligent, it's gonna take you a few times to, re pro probably sometimes three, four times to reset that just with the way the hoof grows. Yes, yep. Uh, I like the uh, Charmin Ultra saying in, with my shoeing, less is more. Yeah. So if, <laughs> if, we, if we don't try to fix everything. Shoeing's like a good roll of toilet oh, paper, baby. I always say. Yeah, sure. <laughs> if you don't try to do it all at once with horses that are way, over, way overdue and have tons of overgrowth or whatever, if you try to do it all at once and get them to where they need to be, more than likely they're going to be sore because their foot has been so grown out of distortion. Yeah. So, but if I can get roughly, you know, 50, 60, even 70% in some cases where I want to be with that foot, yeah. I'll finish the rest over the next one to two shoeings after that. Cool. You know, so it can all be done at once. Uh, I have pictures of before and afters of horses that were way long overdue, you know, first time horses that I'd never done. Uh, there was one gal, she said, I'm new to the area, I moved here. She said, I literally have been looking for a farrier for like seven months and can't find anybody. She said she'd called a few people that they just never showed up yeah. and were flaky. And she said, in the meantime, my horse was just suffering because I could not find anybody. Yeah. So I showed up and had my work cut out for me big time. Yeah. But I was, able to, <laughs> I was able to bring him back uh, pretty good. And then this, the next shoeing after that, I finished up where I wanted it to be. Cool. You know, so... It can't always be all done at once. If you have a farrier that comes and, you know, your horse is way overgrown and way overdue, don't expect to, you know, get a diamond out of a, you know, lump of coal like that right after, right afterwards. You know, it just, it's not realistic. For sure. You have to start somewhere and then work towards where you want it to be so that your horse can stay more sound and uh, not be sore immediately after, you know. Yeah. So here's a... Uh... I think for anybody that's kind of new to horses, that's trying to kind of figure out this farrier deal, how long should owners wait between trimmings and shoeings? I mean, what's, what's that timeline look like? So on, on standard hoof growth, uh, it's six to eight weeks, kind of depending on the horse. Um, I have a lot of performance horses and people that are, that are showing them and things like that, that they want them done every six weeks, you yeah. know, to the week and, and some are even particular enough to the day. Um, and, and for those type of clients that are going to be that consistent on their business and they're always good about paying and they always have a good place for me to shoe their horse, you know, in yep. the summer I get some shade or whatever else, uh, you know, on, on a nice concrete floor or something, I'll show up to the day every time. Yeah. You know, I'm dumb not to. It's bad business pra practice not to. Yeah. But um, a lot of other ranch horses and, and heck, usually even my horses, because I never have time for mine, are on, <laughs> are on like a seven or eight week schedule. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, anywhere from six to eight weeks, depending on the hoof growth of the horse. Some horses' feet grow faster than others. That's just the nature of it. Yeah. Uh, but six to eight weeks on average. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the winter time, like I said, they will they will grow a little bit slower in the cold and things like that in this area. And yep. so, you know, if you need to stretch a trim to, you know, be, and, and the ground's a lot harder and frozen, so they'll wear them down a little more naturally yeah. in the winter time, uh, walking around on the frozen ground. And so, you know, you can go nine or 10 weeks in the winter a lot of times on a, on a trim, you know? Yeah, that's good so it, it's, just, it's just a matter of knowing your horse and, and how fast their feet grow, but yeah. on average six to eight weeks. Yeah, okay. And then, one other question I have for you, um, from the customer's perspective, how long should a shoe stay on? Do you, do you guarantee, should a farrier guarantee, you know, how long a shoe stays on? What does that look like for you to have to, cause, cause it's a pain to come and do resets. Sure. <laughs> but sure. what, what does that look like? So uh, this is, I love this question. I talk with other farriers about it all the time and, and we joke kind of about it. a hard one. It is. We make jokes about it all the time. I will guarantee a shoe on a horse up to six weeks. If they lose one in the first six weeks from the day I shot it, I will come put it back on. Yeah. But uh, because of normal growth of horses' feet and, and, you know, how feet grow and expand and things like that, shoes should start falling off at six, seven, eight weeks. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just the nature of it. There's a lot of old timers, especially, you know, where I grew up, I, I've heard a lot of the old, old time cowboys and, and, and horsemen around. They're like, oh yeah, well we, you know, they judge a shoe job by how long the shoes stay on. Mm -hmm. That's not a good gauge because, you know, you can, you can throw a shoe on a foot and pinch the heels in. So there's no overhang at all and no way for a horse to step that shoe off at all. Um, and whatever you, you can, you can make it so a shoe will stay on for three, four months, but yeah. that doesn't mean you did right by the horse and it's yeah. foot. Um, a good shoe job is based off of a lot of other factors besides that, um, yeah. angles and things like that. I don't like to pinch the heels on the shoes. I like to leave room, room for heel expansion, yeah. um, for, for the heel bulbs to be able to sh absorb shock and do their job. Yeah. Um, pinched heels on a horse can run you into a lot of other problems, uh, contracted yeah. heels and things like that. So at six, seven, eight weeks, you know, shoes should start falling off. Yeah. Um, if they stay on longer than that, that's great, but you should have been getting them scheduled to get redone at that time anyways. Yeah. If you want to do right by your horse, keep them as sound as possible and uh, maintain them and take care of them to the best of your ability. Be calling your farrier every six to eight weeks to stay on top of their feet. And if you don't have four good tires on your truck, it's pretty hard to drive your truck, right? Yep. <laughs> you want your, your horse is a quadruped. It needs four good legs to get around. You want to make sure all four of those feet are taken care of. Yep. So, or Prius for any East Coast or Prius. massage people that or Prius, probably yeah. won't watch this. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. I just, I mean, stay on a schedule with your horse and take care of their feet. Uh, if you want them to last and have longevity, um, it's no different than making sure you're staying on top of your, your brakes and your front end and everything on your vehicle. You know, it's, it's all one and the same, same idea, maintenance, yep. maintenance, yep. taking care of it will make it, make it last longer. Yeah. And we, I mean, this, it, it's it's funny that horse owners like try to be so budget conscious on some things you know like how many times at a rope and do you see somebody show up in a two hundred thousand dollar rig and pull a piece of junk out because they wanted to pay eighteen hundred bucks for a horse you know with a shoeing job that's run too long and it's like i i think you get more respect in the horse world if you show up in a beater and you pull out a really nice horse that has a fresh set of shoes on, you know, if you're in sure. cow horse, maybe a fresh set of sliders. I think, you know, that that's going to get you more respect. Sure. You know, in, in the horse world than, than anything else. There's, there's guys I know that I'll show up uh, and see at Ropens, friends of mine, they'll show up in a, in a pickup with a pipe trailer, a half top trailer, you know, looking yep. pretty, 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 pretty uh, punchy, pretty punchy. <laughs> and been doing some medium to light ranching, you know, <laughs> however you'd want to say it. And they will pull horses out that, you know, are, are as broke and as good a quality horse as you'll find anywhere, you know, yep. because their main concern is the quality of horse. And I've also seen the guy that shows up in, you know, a hundred grand worth of a truck and trailer and uh, pull the horse out that looked like he just got it, you know, out of a kill pan and had never seen a steer day in its life. and. You know, yeah. I just like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's funny to, 
to watch and see that, but you can definitely tell who is more concerned about their horse and their well-being um, and the, the quality of horses that they want to have around and, and how well they maintain their horses. Yeah. Know? Well, and I'm a big proponent of having fewer horses that are more dialed in, especially because mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got kids that, you know, I'm getting into riding and I want them to have something really solid they can go climb on. Sure. Um, and so I, I'm a big proponent of having fewer horses that you take better care of as opposed to having, you know, this, this, this isn't the Cherokee Nation anymore where you measure wealth with how many horses you own. Right. 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 Better to own one good one than sure. three. Quality over quantity. Three yeah. dinks. Yeah. <laughs> Quality over quantity. I'm, I'm the same way, you know. Um, but, you know, we've, uh, my nephew Peyton, who also shoes, we, we talk about this all the time. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to own horses and, and commit to being a responsible owner of a horse, uh, be prepared and be willing to pay whatever it takes to take care of them. Yeah. I mean, make sure you educate yourself so you know if you're not if you're getting took or not. You know, yeah. I, I, we've all heard stories about people that have taken horses to vets or whoever else, and the vet saw them coming a mile away, or whoever was going to help them with their horse saw them a mile away and took them and charged them way too much. So, you know, ask your horse friends, ask ask anybody in the in the in the horse communities or wherever you can, and, and try to gain knowledge, do a little bit of homework, um, and make sure you're going to the right place. Yeah. But uh, be, be willing to do what it takes to stay on a schedule maintaining your horse, you know, their feet, their teeth, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff, staying on top of their, you know, uh, their yearly West Nile, things like that, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Be, be willing to do it because if you don't, they're suffering, yeah. you know, just because you were unwell. I mean, I, I had a, a client I showed up to in May and they had eight, eight head of horses lined up for me to shoe. And I'm like, hey, this is great. This would be a great account to take on, you know? Yeah. I showed up and their feet were something nearly out of a horror film. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I got sick to my stomach looking at them. And I come to find out through asking questions, this was the first week of May and those horses' feet hadn't been touched since the previous September. And she wanted them all done and, and I sat her down and I said, okay, ma'am, I'm gonna do these for you today but we need to have a talk because of, of what I'm seeing here. If you want me to take you on as a client, are these horses gonna stay on a, on a schedule now? Like, I'm surprised half of these can still walk. Yeah. I mean, they were as overgrown and run forward as I've ever seen horses. Yeah. And I felt terrible for them. And not all of them were sound at the time. And it's, a, it's no wonder why. Yeah. And uh, she kind of had the old school mentality. Oh, well, we just shoe them, shoe them every, once every year and ride them through the summer, you know. Uh, that's a disservice to your horse. Yeah, it's it's not kind to your horse. It's not a way to maintain them well and take care of them well, you know. So I said, if you're not willing to stay on a schedule, because when your horses don't stay on a schedule, and they're way overgrown, anytime I do get called to come doing it, it makes my job harder, and I'm just yeah. chasing my tail trying to keep up with staying on top of their feet, and you know, I, I'm, it's hard for me to get them and keep them where, where they need to be as far as their feet go. Yeah. So I told her, I said, if you're unwilling to stay on a schedule, because I'm not going to be the guy that just lets you call me once or twice a year to come show up and try to be Picasso and make these feet <laughs> look good out of the train wreck that they are. Yeah. You know, I said, I'm, I'm not willing to take you on as a client. And she, she didn't like it a whole lot. She got kind of upset and mad. And I said, look, ma'am, that you're doing a disservice to your horse. Yeah. You know, so. Well, and I think you have a good perspective because again you're you're not just a guy that that shoes them like you're you're riding and you're training too so you know you you really value those horses yeah. and, and the time and expense that you put into them so i sure. think you know that that gives you a, a, a different perspective i think there's there's really two things i think about all the time with your horses that will ultimately keep them in good health for a long time and that's hoof health and their teeth Mm -hmm. Like if you stay on top of their teeth, like floating their teeth and also on top of your shoeings and trimmings, like that's going to, yep. that's going to keep you in a pretty good spot. Keep you in a good spot and good quality feed. Yep. You know, yep. You, you take care of those things and you probably have a pretty low maintenance horse. Yep. You know, I, you're not going to have something that's giving you fits all the time yep. because you took care of it. Yep. You know, it's agreed. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a deep, dark hole of, of learning and information, and there's a lot of mystery cases that you have to approach, you know, individually in every single way. I had a friend joke with me once. He's big into 
figuring out how to make things more automated. So, yeah. you know, work smarter, not harder. He's, he's, he's big into figuring out how to make things um, easier for him. And, and he was joking with me one day. He said, you'd think they'd make a machine that you could just, you know, lead a horse up into and it would just do their feet. Yeah. And I, I joked with him and I said, you know, that would be pretty neat in this day and age, you know, with all the technology we have, but shoeing each horse is too individual and, and particular of a thing. It's, I mean, every horse is a fingerprint. Every single horse's feet are going to be different. Yeah. And, you know, guys that I know that have been shoeing for 30 and 40 years still tell me I learned stuff about shoeing horses nearly daily. Yeah. And, and they've been doing it that long. Well, there's also like, when, when you're shoeing a horse, there's a, there's a connection there. Like it, it's not meant to be an animal to a machine, no. right? Like horses don't really understand. Like a horse communicates through body language. They don't get machines. Nope. And so to have somebody that's, you know, actually a horseman climbing un under them to take care of their feet, you know, that, that's, that's language that they can understand a lot better than a machine. Sure. Yeah, I look for body language a ton, um, especially on some of my specialty cases. I'll get done with a foot, and I'll, when I set that horse's foot down, the first, one of the first things I look for is if they'll stop and lick their lips. Yeah. Because that means they're comfortable and they feel good. Yep. You know, uh, body language is huge. Yep. And so if I, if I have a horse that won't do that for me, that, you know, I'm working on fixing things, I, I, I pretty much can assume, hey, a horse probably doesn't feel totally great on that. We need to, we need to keep working on it. Yeah. You know, so watching body language. And, and little things too, uh, you know, Clinton Anderson talks, uh, I think it was on a podcast he did with somebody he was talking and uh, his, his farrier came to him at the Down Under Horsemanship Ranch and he said, hey, Clinton, I just wanted to bring something to your attention. Your horses as a whole haven't been as good the last couple times I've been out and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. You know, can we work on that together and, and, and talk about some things and see if we can figure out how to make it better. Clinton says, yeah, you know, I, I apologized to him and told him, hey, I'm really sorry. We're going to take care of that. We're going to fix it, you know. So he goes to all of his, his clinicians working under him and everybody working at his place. Hey, we've got, we've got our work cut out, cut out for us. Our horses haven't been as good standing for the farrier. So, you know, we need to work on some of those things with them and, and work on picking up their feet and those kind of things. But he also went back to his farrier and he said, I need you to do one thing for me in this. We will do our part. Will you, especially with some of these younger horses and things like that, when you're getting ready to trim their feet or whatever, don't just come stomping and walking up to them like a grizzly bear. They are naturally, by nature, they are a prey animal, right? Yep. We don't want to walk up to them like a predator. If you got a horse yeah. that's pretty wide-eyed and, and watchy and things like that, will you just take a couple of minutes and just walk up to him soft and just pet on him for a minute? Yeah. And let him know that you're not a grizzly bear. Yep. You know, I don't care if you're a big hairy guy, you're not a grizzly bear. Yeah. <laughs> you can walk up to him and just pet on him for a minute and let him know, hey, everything's going to be okay. Because yep. he will feel, you know, your presence and what you're, you're bringing into his zone, into his bubble. Yep. And he needs to know that you're, you're not here to hurt him. Yeah. You know, so I do have a lot of horses that when I go to do them, if I notice that they're really wide eyed and watchy and jumpy or whatever, um, I will take a minute at first and I'll just sit and pet on him for a minute. And, and, uh, you know, just move around them and let them know, hey, it doesn't matter where I am around you. I promise you I'm not going to hurt you, yeah. you know. Uh, but if I get in a situation where, you know, and you learn to just watch horses and, and feel, uh, have, get a feel for them with, between, you know, the, the look in their eye and their, their body language and how they act and things like that, uh, you know, kind of what you're in for. But, uh, you know, in, in, in more severe cases, if I can tell, hey, even, even just moving around and, and uh, just petting on this horse for a minute and stuff, it, it, this horse probably still isn't going to be that safe for me. You know, then we can look into sedation and things like that. Yeah. You know, so because I, if you want your farrier to show back up, any of you that wonder why your farrier stopped answering your text or your phone calls or dodged <laughs> you, ghosted you, whatever. Yeah. There is a reason why, Yeah. you know. I mean, there are rare cases where, hey, uh, he ended up moving or whatever, you know. Yeah. But if your failure is dodging your phone calls or your texts or whatever, there's probably a good reason why. Yeah. You know, either every time he showed up, your horse was bad or you left him in a mud pile to shoe your horse or something like that, you know. 
try to make it as comfortable as possible for your ferry to show up in. If it's if it's summertime, try to get him in some shade if in, if you yeah. can. If it's the winter time, you know, even this time of year, I like to be in the middle of the day out in the sun. That's when it's the warmest. You know, if I can't be inside a barn or something like that, I'd rather be out in the sun on some flat ground. Yep. You know, even if it's even if it's the edge of a, a snow covered driveway, if the driveway's flat where the where the tire tracks have drove over it, you know, yep. I'm okay with that. You know, yep. Um, just just try to think of how you would want it to be if you showed up to to shoe or trim a horse and, and the environment that you'd want to be in. It goes back to the golden golden rule of treating others how you'd want to be treated. Yeah. Put your put yourself in the farrier's shoes and say, okay, what happened last time that would make it so he might not want to show up again? Was my horse terrible? Did he have bad manners? Did I not put him in a good spot to do it? You know, and some of those type of things. And uh, it'll probably help you keep one around uh, easier next time. A lot, lot longer. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Well, Dan, really appreciate you coming and talking, you know, chatting with us about this. Um, your DH farrier service dh farrier service on facebook um all my information's on there um i have pictures of of past work and, and horses and before and afters and things like that i have tons of references of current clients that i have yeah uh that are that are more than willing to take a phone call of a prospective client i mean before you before you buy a new car or truck you test drive it right yeah. I don't mind one bit if some. I, I never get offended if somebody calls me and says, I'd like to have you come out, but I'd like some of your other clients' opinions. You know, yeah. I'd like to talk to them. It doesn't offend me one bit. I, I get it. Yeah. It's fine. You know, yeah. if you want to call my other clients and talk to them about what I've done on their horses and some of those type of things, I get it. It's totally yeah. fine. I won't be offended. Well, I had a pretty high standard, too, before you started doing my horses because uh, Scott McKendrick was kind of a legendary shoer around this part of the country yeah and uh Great you know, guy. Ev everything that he did was like artist work and and your stuff is like it's kind of reminded me of what scott did the way you kind of roll those heels out and i mean everything that i see is just it's it's top quality so then does great work um you know if if your horse stands well then you might be able to get on his books right <laughs> and if you pay on time if you pay on time <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I mean, I, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to really get on people's case about that kind of thing sometimes because, you know, you feel stupid and you don't want to offend people, but at the same time, like, if somebody's going to go up, it's no different than the electrician or whoever coming over to your house, you yeah. know, like, if you're going to have a service done, be prepared to pay for, to be prepared to pay at the time of service, you know, yep. vet clinics are like that and, and a lot of other aspects, you know, I mean, uh, don't don't hang your farrier out and say you know I'll pay you in a week or whatever you know I mean if you have a farrier that you're close friends with um, and and he trusts you or whatever um, I have had certain cases where somebody's like hey you know I just had to put a transmission in my truck things are a little tight right now but my horse needs done and my horse's maintenance does need to come first is it okay if you do it today and I promise you uh, you know I'll pay you in a week you know, whatever. I, I have a, some people that I'm close enough with that I trusted them and I've done that. Um, but I don't do it very often. Yeah. You know? Nor should you. No. So it's a dangerous road to go down. It is. Um, and sometimes because I'm not naturally, uh, I don't like to be mean to people. Nobody likes, nobody cares how good you are at anything if you're not kind. Right. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I don't naturally like to be like that uh, to anybody. But at the same time, I have to pay my bills too, right? Yep. And and this is how I do it. So be prepared when the farrier comes. And if you're not sure, first time farrier, first time with this specific farrier, just ask them, what do you charge so I can be prepared? Yeah. You know, don't don't wait till they show up and do it. And then, oh, well, let me go see if I can round up a checkbook or something, you know, and yeah. it's not <laughs> like you didn't know this was coming, yeah. right? <laughs> so try to be prepared and I promise you if you will do that and be ready um, you know I, you're gonna get the guy back again you, you keep know your barrier around. yeah you'll keep him around a lot longer you know Good um, deal. I have clients that are great about that I have one guy that pays me in cash every single time and he you know I will always 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 cater to him he always has a good spot for me to shoe um, his horses stand well uh, he got a new horse that was a little younger and a little greener. Every time I showed up the first few times uh, that I did that particular horse, he would either run him in the round pen or go ride him or something so the horse's mind was right. He always made sure that things were prepared for me to show up because 
you know, like I said, once again, if you put yourself in the farrier's shoes, you know, if, especially if I'm doing you later in the day, you have a later in the day appointment, you know, I, I've already had a long uh, physically demanding day. And if I have to show up to your house and deal with a horse that's going to, you know, want to try to punt me to Timbuktu, yeah. uh, put yourself in my shoes. You don't want to deal with that either. No. You know, it's, it's been a long, hot day or whatever, middle of July, you know, you're, you're sweating from every pore in your body and didn't know that that much perspiration could come out of you. Didn't know you had that much water. In the yeah, <laughs> and I, the last thing I want to do is show up and, and deal with an unruly horse that doesn't want to stand for me, and those things are so strong and so powerful. I mean, they can hurt a, a person very, very easily, yeah. you know. So be prepared for them, and, you know, those, those type of clients that will do that for me, I will always, always, always cater to them, you yeah. know. So sure. they'll, they'll always get me back out there. They'll always get me to come do their horses and take care of them. And, and uh, like I said, I've become really good friends with a lot of them. And I've made a lot of really cool connections and, and acquaintances, friendships, and uh, things like that. And actually, you know, just access to, you know, other buying and buying other horses and things like that or helping. I helped two of my shoe, shoeing clients. One had a horse for sale. The other one was looking for a horse. Guess what? I linked them up. And the the gal was that bought the horse, you know, it was the perfect match, and and I was super happy to be the matchmaker for that, you know. So yeah. it was cool to to help people make connections and do that for them. But uh, yeah, it's it's a neat game, and it's a it's a black hole, but I like it, and I'm passionate about it, and I get to deal with horses every single day. Yeah, and I love it, and uh, love the love horses in general. So it's been it's been fun for me to dig into and learn and do. It's awesome. So. Then thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate thanks. you. Thanks for the uh, grape uh, knockoff uh, cores here. Yeah, you got pretty, it, buddy. Yeah, it's pretty tasty. I'm going to have to fruity look into it. Fruity beverage for some fruity guys. That's right. That's right. <laughs>